But to go back to my dots, back to my conversation. So this is the context, at least for me, that a lot of these conversations happen. And NEH once said, well, how do you, you know, well, how do you do your formal consultation with the Chinook on this thing? I said, well, gee whiz. We sit around and we talk about the kids and we watch the dogs and we have some salmon and we talk about the project and then we go back and we have a little more salmon and we think about what that child was doing then. And I wrote that up and they were satisfied with that. Uh, and so that's, and to give you an example of how that works, at Capitopolo, this is the excavation at Capitopolo, and the house excavations at Myron Capitopolo contributed considerably to the construction of the plank house there. Um, but in the process of that, the consultation process broke down. The reasons that I won't go into, but the consultation process broke down. And the project could have broken down. It didn't, but it didn't because of the relationships among the people who were working on the house. Go back to that network that went them, not the archaeologists, but the people who were working on the house. Those relationships were important, and so this got constructed. Uh, this is the way it looks now. Uh, the light is wonderful, and this is the dedication. And for me, who have spent 20 years excavating these houses, it is difficult for me to go in, especially when it's empty. When it's empty and the fire's lit, which is, doesn't happen often enough and the breakdown over consultation and maybe a little bit to do with fires. Uh, it's hard for me not to tear up. And also, there's some very fine art in it, a bundle of art. So for me, you know, that's why I'm pleased that my friends from the Chinook ran around well here, because to me, so when Katie asked me to talk about this, it was a requirement that I talk about something that was really personal. Thank you very much, Ken. We'll go ahead and do some q and A. I've got a um, microphone because we're actually recording this. So if you've got a question, raise your hand and I'll bring a microphone to you. Questions? Way in the very back. <laughs> First of all, Dr. Ains, you're going to be sorely missed in our community. I'm not going anywhere. And I hope, hope you do continue to do presentations. Uh, what I'll do is, let's, uh, I have to write all this stuff up. Uh, thank you for those kind words. I'll still teach a couple of classes and supervise graduate students, so I'll, I'm not going anywhere. And I have a question about anything Chinese that you might have found. You found oh. iron, I believe, in Portland. Well, the, yeah, the, 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 the ads is, the chemistry of the ads is Chinese. And so if it is Chinese, it's probably, the hypothesis would be that it originated in the junk. Um, but it also would indicate, if you wanted to talk about Chinese, I want to talk about iron, um, is that in 1450, they were familiar enough with iron so that they could convert a spike into a traditional piece of uh, technology. Uh, so there were no, when this was converted, there were no stranger to iron wherever it came from. But anyway, you wanted to know about Chinese. So there's also, uh, there's Chinese pottery. There's some Chinese pottery, uh, I don't think is uh, Bob Cromo. Oh good, I can say anything I want to. Um, <laughs> we have Chinese ware from the Oregon coast both at Meyer and Catholic probably from a junk, from a galleon that wrecked uh, Bob thinks he's Park Service, thinks probably in the 1690s. So stuff is coming in as a particular kind of uh, Chinese ware a little bit he's very excited about because it. it's the most, it shows up on the Oregon coast, but this is the most easterly that it showed up. Some of that gets turned into tools and things. And we have a few Chinese coins and other things, not very much. I'm interested in the status of Kennewick Man. Where is Kennewick Man right now in, in the study? Kennewick Man is resting in a climate-controlled space in the, in the Burke Museum, uh, very carefully looked after. As far as I know, there are no ongoing, there are no currently any ongoing studies. There's a big round of studies that were done 
a number of years ago, and those were reported in the uh, in the press. But I haven't. There may be some some professional articles out there that come out. I haven't seen them, but it hasn't produced any sort of major major work that I'm aware of. Um, the process that people have to go through to get access to it is fairly arduous. But at the moment, uh, I'm not aware of any animals. Virginia, do you know? Yeah. Yeah. My colleague Virginia is not right now. So, not right now. I'm just wondering what they started, this is very loud, um, started to do with the trash once they stopped the old system. Well, the trash the accumulated in the cellar. <laughs> the trash accumulated in the cellar. That may have been part of the cellar filling in. Uh, but it just stayed in, it's, it's very much, the historic trash is very much in the houses and the rest of it's outside. So, a very deep, large cellar, at least in water. Um, what did they do with their dead? Because in some uh, of those places were not good burial grounds. No, they? no they're, they're placed on, on uh, platforms and in the communities and away from the village. I was also interested in the um, in the issue of trash. Um, well, there's a whole yeah. bunch of really interesting yeah. unresolved questions here. But it's, you know, what I came away from your talk with this thing I felt before, but more so even tonight. That, and so I want to know where you come down on this. But it feels like to me, I and mean, it feels like an incredibly sad time. And that um, I mean, when you combine the impact of epidemic disease, and you see this evidence, shifting evidence of a shift now when you're not basically disposing of your trash, and there's a kind of a use of the word chaotic to disorder. I mean, do you, how do you see this period? I mean, well, I see it from that standpoint, but also the, what we seem to be seeing, or I think, is also that the communities are actually being quite successful in dealing with their new circumstance. And had, you know, it's like, well, if things were different, they'd be different. Uh, and so, so had you not, had there not been the, the devastation of the, of the, uh, of the epidemics, um, might still have, you know, flourishing villages in other locations. So, um, it is very sad. It's one of those things, you tell the story, and then it kind of comes up and it ends, because well, these things are happening and now it stops. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to stress that there's actually work going on, and my friends are here. Uh, so there's work going on about that later story. Uh, so it doesn't just you know, become extinct, it's still there. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's... Oh, the fur trade. It, she wants to know if the fur trade was, was positive or negative, and it was all of the above. Uh, ultimately, because of the epidemics in that city, um, in places that were not as hit as, as bad as places farther north, uh, people were able to, to uh, very much actively accommodate, but then you get the floods of settlers and things like that. And so, but it's it's Catholic Puddle. Well, both of these sites are, are uh, you know, tell a story. They tell a story uh, very strongly. But then you come up to the abandonment, and I suppose you know, I've dug sites that are 5,000 years old, and I think well, these must have been abandoned, but that was 5,000 years ago. Um, and then part of the part of the thing in Catholic Puddle is that when we were there, we had tours, and some of you heard the story. But in the first tour we did, uh, we brought in people from from down there, you know, people. And we couldn't take them all in at once because it was too heavily forested. And we had plastic dirt buckets and we had wheelbarrows. And people began to turn those over and turn over the wheelbarrow. And so while we were doing tours, we had Chinook people out in the meadow singing and dancing and singing. And so the singing had come back. And that was, that helped a lot. But it's, it is a hard, it is a hard story. 